Well, I had been for many years, for years, at the uh, at Brookhaven National Laboratory. I have a degree in botany from plant ecology from Duke, and I'd gone to uh, the University of Maine and taught there for three years. Uh, when I went there, my uh, advisors at Duke weren't very enthusiastic, except that I wanted to teach in New England, and that was a job that was open, and I was glad to go. And I also have connections in Maine. I have, we have an old family farm in Maine. My parents lived there, and so it was a good place to go. They pointed out that, well, George, you can go there, and you'll be teaching the introductory course after three years. You'll be running it, and uh, <clears throat> your office will be in a closet, and the telephone will be down the hall. And after three years, <clears throat> my office was in a closet, the telephone was down the hall, and I was teaching the introductory course and decided that it would be good to move on and get some additional experience. And I thought it would be good to have experience in ionizing radiation because it seemed to be uh, <clears throat> an important issue at that time. And an opportunity came to go and set up a research program at Brookhaven which I <clears throat> was asked to set up and run, and did, and ran it for 14 years. The uh, question was, what are the ecological effects of ionizing radiation if there is a big accident or if the <clears throat> environment becomes contaminated, what are the effects? The issue became interesting because Arnold Sparrow at Brookhaven had worked for years on the effects of ionizing radiation on plants and discovered almost by accident that pine trees were especially sensitive. They had a sensitivity that wasn't greatly different from that of humans, at least under certain circumstances. Maybe 500 Rentgen's exposure was an acute lethal dose under certain circumstances. And uh, <clears throat> so we set up a research program there focused on what the uh, effects would be of long-term chronic exposure to ionizing radiation. This was a, an experiment, of course, with a, a single source of radiation in the center of a fairly uniform forest and that set us off on how do you measure effects? How do you measure the metabolism of the forest? Uh, and just how do you go at this question? And we've worked on that for a long time, of course. Worked out various techniques for appraising the metabolism of the forest. In fact, over the years, we measured the metabolism of that forest using carbon dioxide flux techniques. <clears throat> and this was a fairly exciting time. Brookhaven was a wonderful place to work because you could do anything that had surrounded a good idea. If you had a good idea, you could find money and the opportunity for pursuing it. And we did. We pursued many good ideas. Bob Whitaker came and worked with me. And Herb Borman came the first year I was there. We spent a year figuring out how to do all these things. Herb went off and set up the Hubbard Brook experiment and uh, I stayed at Brookhaven and set up that big experiment. <clears throat> and after 14 years or so, I decided that I did not really want to spend the rest of my life at Brookhaven. I wanted to do some other things and I was thinking about where to go and what to do and <clears throat> and uh, Jim Ebert, who was then the director of the MBL, came in one day and asked me if I would be interested in setting up a research program institute at the MBL. And <clears throat> he elaborated on that, and I thought that was a very good idea. It was in New England. It was uh, within 50 feet of salt water, which was one of the criteria my wife established for finding a new place to live. 
<coughs> we lived on the south shore of Long Island, and uh, it was a very nice place to live right on the bay. And uh, so <coughs> Jim and I had to find money to set up a research institute, and Jim was very good, the MBL. Uh, had a fundraising organization, and I joined in all of that, wrote proposals, many proposals, over the course of about three years, building up a pool of money, about three million dollars or so, it was Jim's help, and Jim was a wonder at it. He was very good. I really admired him, as did everyone else. Then, in 75, we moved there, and I brought in John Hobby and uh, Jerry Melillo, Dan Botkin, who was at Yale, and, uh, uh, <clears throat> and we built an institution. Now, by that time, I had done a lot of research on what we called then the carbon dioxide problem. We'd gotten into it because we were measuring the metabolism of the forest there at Brookhaven. We had a meteorology department with two giant towers, and we had instrumented one of those towers, and we had a set of data that were quite parallel to the Keeling data, and <coughs> showed the annual oscillation in carbon dioxide with a high in the end of the winter in April, and a low at the end of the summer in September and October. And the amplitude was even greater than it was at Mauna Loa in the Keeling data, which pointed, from my standpoint, to the metabolism of forests as being the primary cause. So we were naturally interested in forests around the world, and we started a program in remote sensing because I realized that was the way to measure forest, and we. Uh, brought in Tom Stone, who set it up and ran it for years. And, uh, <clears throat> and I made the overall objective, uh, what we now call the climatic disruption, we called it the carbon dioxide problem then. And we had written, I had written quite a bit about it over through the 60s and the 70s, pointing to it as a big, big, big problem. So I decided that a freestanding institution would be uh, a better opportunity, and that's the Woods Hole Research Center. That's how it got started. The Ecosystem Center continued with uh, John and Jerry as co-directors, and they've done brilliantly, very well. They continued with a focus on the climate issue and did it uh, skillfully, and on the Arctic. And of course, the Arctic these days is really big and really important. So they're, they are really dominant in that realm, and it's a grand thing. They've just done brilliantly, all of them. Well, those are administrative objectives, of course. I really preferred to have an institution that stood on its own uh, feet, uh, found its own money, and, uh, and we did. We pretty much did. We could do what we thought was important. But it was also important that we address what I considered to be the great issues <clears throat> of environment. <clears throat> the greatest issue was the climatic disruption. I thought the climate, the carbon di what we call the carbon dioxide problem, was the big problem. It couples in <clears throat> all of the aspects of biogeochemistry, the biosphere, human welfare, uh, agriculture, and the future, and the past. And uh, <clears throat> I thought it needed every ounce of effort that the scientific commun community could put into it, which was what we did, what we could do. And we made ourselves the experts on the biological causes and effects, and that's what we've done here, of the climatic disruption.
Well, I think of the Ecosystem Center as a, an uh, extraordinary opportunity in science and the Woods Hole Research Center too, because there is a whole series of issues which I refer to at the moment in here as great issues of environment. And the two great issues are the climate and the poisoning of the world. And uh, those issues are matters of acutely matters of uh, human welfare that have a great deal to do with the future of civilization. Uh, ignored, <clears throat> it's devastating, literally devastating. We can't stand it to raise the temperature of the earth by two degrees, three degrees. That'll be 10 degrees in some places. Australia is already only marginally habitable. And the idea that we could allow the temperature, average temperature of the earth to drift up by two degrees is just absolutely unacceptable, yet we're doing it. And the people who are going to stop that or provide the information to stop it are scientists. And we and these two institutions have a better opportunity than anyone else and we should be doing it, have to be doing it.